Good Monday, everyone. Welcome to the VolCourse.com podcast with Rob Lewis, Austin Price, and Jesse Simonton. Brent Hubbs, glad to have you along with us. We are um, one week closer to football, actually college football, coming up on Saturday with the Gators and the Hurricanes to kick things off. And then obviously Tennessee uh, will take to the field a week from this coming Saturday. But the Volunteers coming off a scrimmage uh, this past Saturday where, Jesse, there was a lot of talk afterwards from Jeremy Pruitt, kind of a little bit of what you were talking about in, in our Friday podcast, who's above the line, who's below the line. Two weeks to go, how much more movement can there be on the line in terms of who's above and who's below with, with just a handful of practices before you get into game week? I think there's still movement afoot, don't you think, AP? I mean, if a guy like Darnell Wright continues to push, I think, I think going into that scrimmage, he may have been someone that was teetering on the line, but if he can continue to push, does that put him over the line where well, he was going to play against Georgia State and, and the Chattanoogas, but does it ex- accelerate a guy like his path to potentially a starting job? Well, and they've been moving people around, Jesse, a bunch. I mean, Marcus Tatum's played right tackle, and now he's been playing some left tackle. Wanye's played some guard. Um, you know, I, I think there's some... Ryan know, Johnson's played four spots. Yeah, yeah Ryan Johnson has played <laughs> tackle. And, and from all accounts, it maybe looks better, you know, as a reserve tackle, just as about as much as anybody. So, um, just kind of interested to see how this offensive line shakes out. Chalking up Kennedy as your center and Trey as your left guard. And Tatum you know, in the lineup, and, but and, just yeah, you don't know where. Yeah, Who, who's your other two? You know, I mean, it, at tackle, I mean, it depends, I guess, where Tatum plays. If he plays left, then you probably like Darnell at right because he's really the only guy that else has went over there. If he's at right, if Tatum's at right, then one year Jameer. And then that right guard slot, you know, that, that one's totally up for grabs with uh, 12 days to go. It's interesting, the fact. I, I thought, Rob, one of the takeaways from what Pruitt said was, yes, we played a bunch of different combinations, and now we're going to go back and watch the film and see what, which five, what grouping was the most productive. It, it almost felt like it was a little bit of an open audition in, in some cases as opposed to, hey, we're shuffling guys around in case somebody gets hurt here, and just some cross-training. It was almost like, okay, guys, here's the scrimmage. We're going to play some of you in multiple spots in the scrimmage, and then we're going to determine what five looks or four looks the best if you put Trey in as your fifth, and that's going to end up where we go with our offensive line. Yeah, and I think, you know, true it's poo-pooed it, but I I think – a lot of it's been coach speak. I mean, I think there is some, some pressure. I, mean, I think the clock's ticking to get five. I mean, I know you get two warm-up games, basically, to start the season. But, I mean, I'm a big believer in continuity. Chemistry is a big deal. On the, I mean, you know, getting five guys to play together, getting five guys to communicate, that are comfortable with each other. And I, I think, you know, we've all kind of heard rumbles of this. I think Jim Chaney is way more interested in physicality than a guy knowing, you know, knowing the playbook inside and out. You know, I mean, he's wanting people that can move guys in the run game and, I think that's going to be a tiebreaker in a lot of cases, like who can be more physical, who can push people off the ball. When Austin, do you think that's the reason why we hear that maybe Darnell Wright got as many snaps as anybody did in, in Saturday's scrimmage? Is It is that, you know, not necessarily, hey, this is, you're, you know, you've got the job, but it's a little bit of what Jeremy was talking about and saying, you know, are you coaching the right guys? Are you giving that guy more reps because you see that guy's got the biggest upside of anybody there? So now you're – you're almost forcing him to make a push. Yeah, it's a crash course. You know, I mean, they're crash course in Darnell, in my opinion. I mean, he, I won't say doubled the amount of reps of some of those other tackles, but it was close to double. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, you know, reps that Darnell got on Saturday, you know, and then, you know, they're looking for, you know, guys to, you know, just kind of figure out who, who's your most athletic yet physical five. You know, a guy like Riley Locklear, two weeks ago, I never would have thought he would be a factor and he's right there at that right guard spot, mostly because, you know, he's pushing 300 pounds now. I think mean, he's in like 295, 296, and, uh, and, and is much more of a factor than I ever thought he would be. There's also, the, I mean, like Jeremy, one of Jeremy's favorite buzzwords is sustain. You know, can you sustain? Can they sustain? He, he said that multiple times after the scrimmage on Saturday. And in talking to folks, I mean, that's something that's holding a guy like Juan Yane Morris back. I mean, there's a reason why he hasn't, despite being here in the spring and despite the expectations and whatnot, he hasn't locked down that left tackle job because of that very reason. There, you know, whether it's consistency, consistent effort, conditioning, uh, that 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 kind of is something that I think right now is is kind of holding him back. The one thing I do think that was kind of interesting about Jeremy's comments at least enlightening when you kind of think about it in the big picture, not even necessarily just with the offensive line, is that a year ago, 
in a lot of spots, I actually thought Tennessee did the opposite of what he said. Now, they played the freshman corners, and, and Trayvon Flowers got some run, but they didn't do that with the defensive line. They really didn't do that even with the, you know, they played who they had, I guess, at the offensive line. Uh, but even a guy like Jeremy Banks, I know he had the fumbling stuff. You know, they in the end, they leaned on reliability and guys who knew what they were doing versus, you know, well, maybe in five or six games. Well, otherwise, you know, the, the, the Mincy's or the Emerson's or those guys, I think, would have seen more playing time a year ago. I thought that was the most illuminating, maybe the only illuminating thing. Yes. He said after, you know, post scrimmage on Saturday was, you know, talking about if you – we got older guys who know what to do, know where to be, but you know maybe they have five opportunities to make a play in the scrimmage and they don't make it. Then we got a kid basically flying by the seat of his pants, but when he gets five opportunities, he makes four plays. And, and you just feel like there was a red light of Roman Harrison's name out yeah. there about that. Well, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, or, to, or yeah. Crouch or Crouch, Toto. Yeah. I mean, so, so you know, I to, mean, to, <laughs> to, 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 you gotta to, pull to, up the uh, hostage video <laughs> as Jesse called it. <laughs> So, I mean, his quote directly was, so there's a part, I'm just pulling out part of this. So there's a fine line if you're coaching the right people. That's something we have to make a decision on in the next couple of days moving forward. There's some guys who aren't ready to play right now. Um, what, five that, or six games? Right, ago. that the fourth or fifth week they might be starting. If you're a Tennessee fan, do you like that? I mean, is that... Does that create some excitement for you about this team getting better and moving in the right way? And, and boy, they hit on this recruiting class, or is that the red flag of, oh, geez, it's going to be long? I mean, I think one thing it's a reflection of Butch's last class here, which was just an unmitigated disaster on a lot of fronts. And I think it's also a reflection of the way Jeremy you know, recruited this past season in particular when you're talking about Henry T and, and, and Crouch and Eric Gray and you know, Ward Burrell, it looks like, Roman Harrison. You know, Darton, I mean, two five-star tackles. I mean, I, I mean, what was Coach Fulmer always say? Talent eventually is going to win out over experience. I mean, I, I think that's what we're looking at with this team in a lot of places. Well, for me, I, I know that, you know, if you're, a, if you're looking at it from a fan's perspective, the freshmen are kind of like that shiny object. And so, you, you, you know, you just because they're a five-star or a high four-star or whatever, you expect them to come in and play right away. That sometimes just – it's unrealistic, it's, you know. It's, all, it's often unrealistic. And and there's very few Trey Smiths out there. So, you know, sometimes you have to force one in there because of lack of depth or injury. But, you know, I mean, if you can, you know, if, if a guy like Henry starts game one and, and Warren Burrell plays a lot, I mean, that's, that's to me, a, 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 a real positive for the defense just to have those young guys that far along that they feel comfortable with them enough to play them above a guy like Will Ignat, who's been in the program, or – you know some of those other older corners like Kenneth George, um, so I, I understand like why you could you would might look at it from a negative standpoint though, like you know like oh we gotta go with Marcus Tatum again. We saw what happened last time he played, or this person or that person. No, I mean from a standpoint of you know four or five games in, there's this youth movement and everybody's going to take their lumps and you're going to take you know you're going to because look the, the part of the narrative about Tennessee this summer has been. See, they're bringing all these guys back. Yeah, they're exactly. bring, and now here Jeremy Pruitt's talking about, you know, we got we got some guys here that four or five games, they're not ready to play, but in four or five games they're going to be starters on our team. But see, I don't think this I don't I don't look at it as a youth movement and lumps because these, you know, especially two of the first three, you're going to get to play a lot of those kids a lot of a lot of reps. So I think it's just more so they're going to play early on, but they may play 10 snaps against Florida whereas they may by, you know, Florida was, you know, where the Mississippi State game was, they may play 30 snaps. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I, I mean, that's a youth movement. If you're playing, if you're playing eight to ten freshmen, 30 snaps the first week of October, then you're you're in a, you're in a youth movement because you're you're taking some older guys and you're saying you're basically shelving them and hey, we're but, we're riding with we're riding with the with, and I'm not saying it's a negative I, thing. See, I view when you say youth movement, I think well. These guys aren't ready, but we're going to just throw them out there and let them just learn on the fly. Whereas I, the way I look at it is, is if they do that, they feel like those guys are ready enough to to deal with that kind of, of workload. I, you know, when, when, when you say youth movement, in my I mind... I kind of feel like y'all are arguing the same thing. I mean, Jeremy's own comments are that these kids are going to make mistakes, but when push comes to shove, more often than not, compared to the veteran counterparts, they're going to make a play 
when some of these other guys aren't. Let so they're going to make. I mean, it is a youth movement. If you if you play, if you play ten freshmen against Alabama. Okay. I mean, I just know what in my mind the youth movement would be like. Like a few years ago, when the Braves or or when any major league team decides to sell you know the trade deadline and enroll with their young guys late in the year. That to me is what I think when I think youth movement, not. I, I, I think in this case, I mean, you're giving up on the season. I think in this case, Pruitt is looking at it in a lot of ways, like playing these young guys gives him the best chance to win, just because yes. of yeah. more talented, even if they're not experienced. I mean, look, seriously, look at Butch's last two classes: the guys that are juniors, redshirt seniors. What? I mean, how many NFL legit NFL prospects are there? A couple: Daryl Taylor, Callaway, maybe Nigel. Trey would be especially Trey totally. Palmer, JG. I mean, it's a, that's the thing is that it, it won't I mean, be a not, fully quote unquote youth movement because there's still any first day guys though. No, probably no, no, no. But Which, but Tennessee's also going to have to count on the Ty Chandlers and these guys if they want to get to a bowl game. I mean, you know, that's there's going to be a balance there. And the best thing that can happen for Tennessee, in my perspective, a guy who made some plays in the scrimmage, if DeAndre Johnson keeps playing well, it only benefits Tennessee to have more pass rushers. You sure. know, so ro- so you have Roman Harrison, who's kind of this Tasmanian devil, who plays uh, a lot. To me, plays a lot like on third downs, passing downs. Yeah, and and but but you know you have it. Just the more bodies that are contributing, it's going to be the better. So th- there will be some guys that straight up lose their spots, and I think there'll be other guys. You know, if uh, Deon, I'm using DeAndre as an example, if he can continue to play well, uh, or a Brandon Johnson, you know, who's kind of emerged late, you know, now as a senior. You know, that, that they go, that Tennessee's hoping that there's kind of this this mesh and combination of youth and and veteran savviness. Because you, I mean, that what you're talking about with DeAndre, if he if he can hold up, then that lets you put like a Roman Harrison or a Crouch in a niche role. Exactly. You, know, you can just teach, you can yeah. focus teaching them a small package, yeah. as opposed to depending on them to you know know where all these moving parts are supposed to be on first down or second down. Just you know, go get the quarterback. Yeah, I think it's going to be. I think it goes back to what Jesse said you know, several minutes ago is, are they really going to do it? Because, as you mentioned, they did they did in the secondary last year. And they did that on day the cor- one. On the cor- at the corners. Yeah. But were they not forced to there? Is there any spot where you feel like they're forced to this year? Well, I mean, I mean everybody up front on the defensive line is a youth movement. Yeah. Okay. But they're going to have to play a freshman. I think they're going to have to play a freshman tackle. They're going to be forced yeah. to play a freshman offensive tackle. I mean, I, I, mean, I think that's a given. I think they're going to be. I mean, like tied in. Like I don't. The more you get into fall camp, I feels like those guys get further and further away from playing. That the, the, the Austin Popes, the um, Jackson Lowe's. Well, the Jackson Lowe's and the Sean Browns are getting further away from playing. I'm yeah. saying like the Austin Popes and the uh, who's the walk on Craig. Craig. You know, those kind of guys are going to be factors again, in my opinion. But that's what. But that's what I'm saying is that that, that the reliability in more times than not. His, history says coaches are going to act they, they like to say this sure. but then coaches ultimately will lean on the guys that don't screw up so Baylor Buchanan didn't <laughs> which, make a whole lot is, of plays which is why Mark Levine started at Florida in 1997 yeah. well Baylor Buchanan is a perfect example <laughs> now it's <laughs> you know Baylor Buchanan I think is like the perfect example for this he did not make very many plays at all in the star position a year ago yet he was out there every game because he knew what he was supposed to do. He knew where to line up, and he wasn't going to screw up mentally. He wasn't going to make a mental mistake. I think it's going to be. It's, I, it's a, you know, and, I, and then there was the Kenneth Georges and those guys that they could have put there, but they didn't. I, I think it's going to be interesting to see if this quote ends up being rhetoric and just coach speak, or if there's something, if there's if there's a lot of meat to this quote. Now, also with you, the first two games. I mean, you should be able. You should play everybody. I mean, if you don't, then you've 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 wasted well, a huge three. opportunity. Maybe not against. We'll see about BYU. Well, I mean, two out of the three. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested to see how quick they are. I mean, because I mean, Garantano played the back part of the schedule two years ago and got beat to pieces, and then last year played most of the year except for when he got knocked out of a couple of games. I still think he needs reps. I mean, just game reps. Am I, am I wrong in that? I mean, like, my point is, is like you really need to kind of get. The two guys behind him, some action, like in those two of those first three games. But at the same time, don't you think he almost needs them just to sharpen up, or or do you think no, he just? I mean, I, I agree with. Him. I mean, for a guy who's a redshirt junior, he's not played a ton of football. But uh, on by that same token, I mean, just preparing for all eventualities, you don't want J.T. Shroud or Brian Moore's first college snap to come 
you know, at Florida, if Jared, you know, <laughs> something happens to him. Or with Georgia staring well, down the barrel. And I think, I think back to uh, what would have been Josh Dobbs' freshman year. You know, I don't think Tennessee played that. Remember, they didn't play those freshmen in the opener against Western Kentucky or whoever Butch he had and, then. And Raleigh. You know, and then all of a sudden it comes back that Dobbs' first snaps in an SEC game on the road. At Alabama. At Alabama. He had never been on Up the field against the before. goal line. Yeah, uh, coming, coming, <laughs> off, coming out, you know, he's coming out against Alabama, first time ever taking a snap because you didn't play him in a 52-10. to 10. Now, you didn't have the four-game redshirt rule. You know, back then, but you also knew you weren't going to get through the whole season of where you were a quarterback. Either. Yeah, well, that's why, and that's why it's imperative that Tennessee and they should be able to do this because Georgia State and, and, and Chattanooga are bad football teams. But a year ago, they did not beat the hell out of some of these teams. Charlotte, that 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 where you could have gotten a shroud or somebody like that, you know, some some, some burn. So they need to step on the you know gas early in week one and in week three so that you can get some of these youngsters whether it's backup quarterback or you know get get the freshman tackles as much you know opportunities as possible eric gray eric, you know, Banks, the, yeah and some of these other guys whether they're a freshman or a sophomore or whatever the case may be all right let's talk let's talk about other elements of the scrimmage takeaway not not from jeremy pruitt's comments but from talking to people what's your takeaway give me an offensive takeaway from the scrimmage callaway I mean, you know, it just it, suddenly it certainly feels like that's where Jared's going to look in, in a critical situation. Doesn't yeah, it? I agree with that. I, I think the comfort level's there. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say that he and Juwan Jennings are like not on the same page, but I mean, you watch when when he's throwing to Callaway in practice versus when he's throwing to Juwan, it does seem like there are more miscommunication on on throws and stuff, and how shallow or. Or, or, or steep you run a route that those type of things with Jawan um, and then Palmer well I thought you know he was going to take a, a step and I still think he can it just seems like that Callaway has honed his craft enough to, to really kind of become JG's number one guy anybody else want an offensive takeaway I mean I would I would go with the receivers and it's not surprising <laughs> when you look at that's where the by, you know far and away the most veteran <clears throat> veterans are, I mean, and good veterans I mean guys that have played and, and had success and you know, kind of the one position group that Jeremy has pretty consistently, you know, mentioned in a positive light. I mean, I, I think Callaway and Palmer both have, have proven themselves as playmakers, and it sounds like they're, you know, that, like Austin said, taking a step. I mean, I, and I made a comment about this on the board, I guess Saturday evening or maybe Sunday morning, that you know, these things are always zero sum. One side's winning, one side's losing. So it's however you want to look at it. Right. But I think it, it it is at least encouraging for the offense that they. Despite all these all these different O line combinations and whatnot, more often than not, Saturday they were moving the football and they were generating drives. Now they were sloppy at times, which is is the concern. They had, you know, Ty had a couple fumbles, Eric Gray had a couple fumbles, Banks had a fumble, but when they weren't coughing up the football, they were they were either marching down the field or they had some explosive plays. And I think that 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 that's a, that's an encouraging deal for an offense again that that a year ago was you know putrid to pedestrian at times as you mentioned there's there's a winner and a loser on your own team when, yes. when you have a scrimmage so for all of that being good defensively the concern has to remain just squarely on the defensive front which we've talked about ad nauseum you know for, for the last six months the fact that really two scrimmages i mean you go back to that first scrimmage they had to settle for field goals but that was an offense that moved the football right maybe pedestrian like without a bunch of explosive plays but they moved the football decently uh, in both scrimmages, which I guess you would expect some of that defensive front. Those guys, they got to find, they got to find a rhythm. They got to find some, they got to learn on the job in a hurry against Georgia State. Yep. Yep. Okay. I mean, and, and yeah, I mean, it's not gonna, a surprise. Not a surprise. It's not, it's not a negative like, oh, there's this newfounded issue. The fact of the matter is, Emmett Gooden's out for the year, and you're playing with a bunch of guys who haven't played college football at this level. And you're, yeah, and you still have the. The matzo ball hanging out there with Solomon, who didn't play as much on Saturday as he had in the first scrimmage. Yeah, and who knows when you get an answer to that? It, you it's know, twelve days uh, away. It's getting, it's getting yeah. late. Yeah, it's getting late in the process, and I mean, who who knows? You know, it may be two more weeks or three weeks before you get an answer. I mean, they may fight it all season long with you know appeal versus appeal, or all you know, who knows how that's going to play out. What we know is that Tennessee's not going to offer up any information about it because Jeremy Pruitt has been very um, stoic and static in his answer of 
we don't know anything and we don't have a timetable. So you got to continue to prepare as if, if as if you don't have him. What do you like about this defense? I think they're preparing like they do have him. <laughs> he just keeps getting more and more reps. Uh, well, he didn't play as much on Saturday, apparently. No, but it didn't go down drastic. I mean, I, I think they're still – I mean – well, they're hopeful. I mean, they yeah. have no reason not until until you get to, I think, look, really, I think, until you get to, like, the week of BYU, I think you have no reason not to be optimistic. No doubt. Or be hopeful, I should say. Not necessarily optimistic, but be hopeful. Now, when you get to that point, that's when it's it, it, the concern settles in. I, it, it, it remains very strange to me, though, that Jeremy, the, the most public he's come out about any of this stuff was when he was asked a couple weeks ago, about the status of both Solomon and Gibbs, and he immediately was like, "Oh well, Gibbs is going to redshirt. He's not going to get it. Like he's not. He, he's going to redshirt. They transfer him with NCAA. That, that's it. And yet, we still haven't even heard official word on him. You know, there's been no official word that D'Angelo Gibbs got a waiver denied because he. I mean, he hired a lawyer. He did all. He, you know, he wanted to try to see if he could play. So that that or maybe that, that answer was Jeremy's version of the official word. Perhaps that that could that could possibly be the case. Or as, also, we, or as we joked about, like when you self-impose violations, yeah. <laughs> we'll let you have D'Angelo. <laughs> just give us off. I mean, and also if you, I mean, watching practice, I mean, D'Angelo is generally like one of the last guys to take yes. a rep and routes on air and stuff, whereas Aubrey is always. One of the first guys up, and and, and by the way, I still like this dude at receiver more than I do safety. He oh. just looks. Does he not look better to you, receiver? He's a quick twitch guy. I mean, that's you can definitely tell that in what we get to see. I, mean, I think he's a phenomenal athlete. I think it's just how naturally does he catch the football? Yeah, and, and you know, we're, from a work standpoint, where's he? Where's he going to be at? And they got to leave some receiver. Over it there. certainly seems Jeremy, like they're Jeremy leaning. Can't. It certainly seems like they're leaning that direction. Yeah, he's no, I mean, means. he had, he had, like means. Yeah, means. He can't take all the wide receivers. He got to leave T. Martin somebody to coach. I mean, there's a bunch of seniors on that deal. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'll leave you Tyler Bird. <laughs> you know, a bunch of guys who aren't going to be there. So somebody's got to be on on that side of the ball. Um, so as Tennessee comes out of the the spring or comes out of the scrimmage, um, heading into this week, Jeremy says that you know they feel good about their return game. Their kicking game has been pretty solid. Who who you got? Returning punch. You got Callaway, per se, the Callaway, safe guy. Callaway, well, Callaway apparently had a big return on Saturday. I think it's going to be Callaway at punt returner, Bryce backing him up, and I think Bryce is going to return kicks over Ty Chandler. If oh, I'm like, picking today. Those are, I mean, I, I feel like Callaway, I mean, senior, you know, also has some big playability, but more, even more than that, is reliable. You don't you know, feel good about him not laying it on the ground. I, mean, I think that's huge. Plus, well, Tennessee's Twitter touted him out of having some kind of was it some silly average or whatever it was? I didn't see that. But oh, I, this was like a month or two ago. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like, he just makes the most sense, and he's reliable catching the football. Well, and, and the um, biggest thing is, too, remember Bryce had a couple opportunities last year. Not too many, but had a couple when they were worried about get Callaway getting dinged up. And there were some times that Jeremy got on to him because he let the ball hit the ground. You know, when you and then Jeremy's talked about that hidden yardage and whatever. Right. I mean, Tennessee can't afford – Callaway – more often than comes not, up and gets it. He goes and find. He goes and finds it. You, well, you may, you may not, may, maybe you can't return it. It's call a fair catch, but don't lose twenty yards because yeah. the ball hits and then rolls. So, right. he, but I do think they have. They, they envision getting Bryce the ball uh, as a kick returner. And then I think the two sneaky guys in the kick return game, to me, would be um, Eric Gray yeah. and Kenny Solomon. I, I think Solomon's a guy. I don't know if he gets that kind of duty as a freshman. But eventually, I think that you know he does. Uh, you know, you just waking up. No. Um, <laughs> but I think he does. Smokers going um, to put clothes in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> my house too. Um, but I do think that he's a guy that this staff likes a lot in that role. And Gray could grow into that role if if he can hold on to the football. Because I mean, he has that natural that natural wiggle that you like uh, as a kick returner. All right, so this week, if you're you heard Jeremy Pruitt's comments and some of the stuff we've talked about, if you're this coaching staff this week, give me priorities one and two. Well, I think reps. I mean, we're obviously not seeing practice today. We'll see what happens Tuesday and the rest of this week. But I mean, I think they're going to start. You know, there's the above the line and below the line, and is that, so is that the biggest priority? Yeah, and so you, I think you're starting to figure that out. And do do we get closer? Come. This little situational walkthrough, whatever they're going to do, you know, on Saturday, uh, are they closer to kind of identifying a starting five heading into quote unquote game week a week from today? 
I think I mean, on the offensive line. I mean, I, I would agree with that. And also, I mean, the I'm, I, I think the above the line, or below the line. Like, who are the forty-four, or, you know, and change that you're that are they're going to be getting all the practice reps. I mean, we're, next week's going to be game week. By then, I mean, I think you've got to know who's kind of relegated to scout team status and, and who you're really you know, spending your time focusing on, like Jeremy said, which guy, are you coaching the right guys? I mean, I think you've got to figure that out this week. Yeah, we'll see if Jeremy Pruitt gives out any kind of depth chart. Or it might be the Zach Stipe depth chart come Monday, organizational chart. Shamberg going to win the star job? He played a lot of star again on Saturday. I think also, you know, it's been, and we had this kind of, Tennessee is mostly healthy right now, but they got some guys that are a little bit dinged up, DWA, whatever. I think you'll, you'll, you'll likely see them manage, you know, those guys in terms of kind of keeping them uh, as healthy as possible, you know, for the next 10 days, 12 days before we get ready for game one. Jeremy Pruitt saying this week that they're going to work as the week progresses. They'll start to work on some of their early opponents. Hint, hint, we're going to put in some BYU stuff. We're going to focus on some of the things they do focus on some of the things Florida does. That would be what, my guess. That's yeah. what the extent of that conversation or that comment meant. Uh, on recruiting quickly, as we as we dive into that, obviously Tennessee picks up a big time commitment on Friday afternoon, uh, continue to try to plant a flag in North Georgia. Um, and we'll see what happens and what that means for Trying to Eric build the Gilbert underground, and, underground <laughs> pipeline there. <laughs> but that's, I mean, for, for a team that's, we've talked about this when you did, we did boards in the spring, you know, position boards, looking at this. I mean, the one thing we've all asked about is where's, where's the edge guys? Where's the rush guys? And getting BJ is a huge get for Tennessee in that way. What's next in recruiting? Well, they got a couple guys that are set to well, announce Well, Trayvon is set to days. go tomorrow. Um, and then Mike, or Mordecai McDaniel is uh, set to go Wednesday. Um, is Ripka a coin flip? I think so, man. I, you know, I've talked to both sides, and he has not told Kentucky that he's in. He sure not told Tennessee he's in. Um, I think the kid's genuinely torn. I think the kid likes Kentucky a lot. Um, I think the kid feels pressure to go to Tennessee um, from from the people in Dixon. So, um, you know, I, I do think it's a total coin flip. I don't, you know, I think he has a feeling of where he wants to go, but he has not informed anybody to this point uh, where he's going. If it's a coin flip, is this one over tomorrow? No. You think that one will go? It'll, it'll battle all the way for both schools. It, for both schools, but specifically if he does pick Kentucky, I think Tennessee will have a chance to swing this kid back. You know, because you know if Tennessee goes out and they have the year that they hope they have, um, I think the pressure is going to continue to be there all year from people around him to get in the boat. David Johnson, Derek Ansley, they're not going to go down until this kid signs some papers and headed north on 75 to Lexington. So. Um, you know, I, in my opinion, if it's more specifically, if he picks Kentucky, it's sure not over. Um, but I don't think it's over regardless because I think Kentucky will continue to swing there. Mordecai McDaniel, is track going to be enough? I think Tennessee feels season? much better, obviously, about their position with Mordecai McDaniel. I mean, that's we, we kind of talked a little bit about that on Friday. Uh, the, the track program, huge there. Um, I, I think, you know, that's why Tennessee – did not freak, and they continue to recruit Antonio Johnson, but that's why they did not freak when Antonio Johnson decommitted and there was all the A&M buzz uh, around him. So Mordecai would be that safety, you know, nickel type guy um, in this class, and, and in all likelihood, Austin, I would think that he may be uh, the last defensive back commitment in this class if they were able to, to pull him in in the boat on Wednesday. Yeah, I mean, one would think, um, unless just a big timer fell your way, you know. But they're not really. I mean, like, and especially not. when you know AP and I are having this discussion off, off air. But you know, Tennessee's going to have some interesting decisions if some other guys want in at other spots, inside linebacker, yeah, I mean, wide like, receiver. I mean, so so I, I, I think if it goes well, Antonio Johnson may still come here, may still you know, but I or may still come here on a visit or, or whatever. But I think Tennessee would probably be done unless they had movement within the class that somebody decommitted and they need to fill that spot. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. And, and if you go back to the podcast right after, and even the chat right after Antonio Johnson committed, I, I said Mordecai McDaniel was higher on the board. Yeah. You know, I know he was rated higher by rivals or whoever, but you know, for Tennessee, Mordecai McDaniel has always been higher on the board than Antonio Johnson. So, um, would be a big get, and obviously it helps them with Rakim. Um, 
you know. But you're right. I mean, they're, they're going to have some decisions to make, you know, because you really can't, you know, to me, you can't afford to slow play a couple of these kids, and you know, in waiting on one of these five star kids, you know. I mean, like you, you know, you look at a guy like um, Lenneth Whitehead. Ian Bryce and Eason, if they both want in, you got to take those kids. And I think they would take both those kids. But what happens with Noah Sewell later down the road? You will take all three. Um, I don't. I, you're you're sure going to take Sewell if he right. wants to come. You know, so that's what I'm saying. Know. Like, but you can't afford to say, "Hey, wait." But know. then, so, but 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 if you take Sewell, and the the point is, is that they're not going to turn down Eason or Whitehead right now. Uh, and so you may be you may be. That, that spot for Sewell. Now, if Sewell still wants in, he'd get in, but perhaps that spot goes somewhere else. Yeah, you take one less guy in yeah. the position, that type of thing, certainly. Yeah. I mean, there's some, some guys you're going to hold spots for. for sure. And well, here's the other thing we know. The fall is when, it start, is when recruiting starts. I mean, there's all kinds of jockeying going to take place over the course uh, well, yeah, of I mean, the next a, three or four months. And a, year, a year ago, Eric Gray was not even taking Tennessee's phone calls. Right. And, and this is, <laughs> you know, th- th- this, we, this can be a, a broader discussion. This can be a broader discussion later in the fall. You know, maybe on an off week or something like that. But I would be curious if some coaches and maybe I need to talk to some people on staff and kind of get their feet. I would be curious if folks now with the transfer portal and so much movement, if some coaches would like that 25 rule relax a little bit, move oh, it to move it to, move it to 28 or something like that. You know, you still have the 85 hard uh, because it's hard to to really get yourself constantly with. To be at 85, well, Florida, Florida's going to be playing with all their stuff this year. All these guys transferring, you know, not qualifying or whatever. I think th- th- there was some thing came out just because they're going to play obviously in this week zero. They're going to take like 60 kids or something to Orlando. That's and then like, that's what they have. It's not like that's their travel roster. Like that's what they. It was like 63 kids because of medicals and out. I mean that. I mean that you're a hand more players at Carter High School. What I'm saying, you're handcuffed <laughs> with that, I and mean, you can't get those kids back. It's not like you get to sign 30 or whatever. And I, I just, again, this would be a broader discussion. It's just something I thought about when I saw that. If some folks, I think, could pine that, hey, could, let's relax this 25 rule and put it back to 28 or something like that, because there is so much movement now in college. Football. Well, I mean, Jeremy said on the Nation with Chris and I last night. I mean, you know, this is the first class that they've been able to sign a full 25. You know, and he thinks that's that's massive. You know, for the program. So, you know, they've been trying to get past the gray shirts and the blue shirts and the orange shirts and the yellow shirts and, and the grad transfers. And, and, and they've done, yeah, you know, some of that's been self-inflicted. Right. Some, yeah. But 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 when you go back it over is. the last four yeah. or five years, yeah. they've there's been so many classes that were right. shortened by that. Well, with the transfer, with the prominence of transfers out there in the 25, and everything, it's hard to fl- it's hard to flip a roster. It's a lot yeah. harder to flip a roster. Than it used to be. Speaking of rosters, as we wrap it up, anything on Jaden Spring or anything in the hoops world, right quick? I mean, nothing, nothing major. I mean, they were all the whole team was gone last week, so the coaches were taking it easy. I mean, Tennessee's right in the thick of it for, for Jaden Springer. I mean, still centering everything around Georgia weekend for everybody. I, I think that's when he's going to be in, and I think you'll see Tennessee bring their other two commitments in that that weekend. I know. I mean, those those three guys: Corey Walker, Keon Johnson, Jaden Springer. And PJ Hall's coming in the. Uh, 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 so October, Alabama weekend. It? Alabama weekend. So, not out. Um, I'm just, those three guys are in a group chat and they would talk all the time. I mean, I know if just from talking to some people that, that Keon and, and, and Jaden have gotten pretty close. That doesn't mean Tennessee's going to get him. But um, I'm probably getting to the point where I would worry less about North Carolina and more about, you know, somebody else jumping in there. Like, with, like, like Memphis like or Like Memphis. Or, but I, I still, if it's Tennessee and Memphis, I, I like Tennessee's chances. Yeah. And more so than. I, mean, I think I think North Carolina has slow played him, have prioritized a, you know another guy, Bryce Thompson over Jaden. I don't, I don't. I think that's going to hurt him. Yeah, yeah. because Jay, Jaden's aware of that. You know that. that, that oh, yeah. I mean, he's the, he's the number not, twelve player in the country, and I'm right. not saying he's got a huge ego, but he's the number he, twelve player. In the country. Yeah. Uh, anything on Euros in terms of the, nope. the appeal there? Uh, and last it's the, it's the appeal nobody's talking about. Talk was, <laughs> yeah, it's all way short of Aubrey Solomon, but uh, I mean last. Talked with somebody last week with, with some insight, and they feel like they'll, they will hear something in September. You know, basketball didn't start till first, second week of October, as far as practice goes. So I, I don't think there's a huge panic there. But you know, I continue to Tennessee continues to express optimism behind the scenes when I talk to people. But we'll see. I mean, you know better than I do. You just can't ever assume anything with the NCAA when it comes to this kind of stuff. Certainly can. We'll have full coverage of uh, basketball, recruiting, and obviously football as uh, the 
Uh, the football team's on the practice field today. There's no media access today, but uh, hopefully get an opportunity to see some things tomorrow and throughout the rest of the week as Tennessee moves closer and closer to game week. And congratulations, you've made it back to college football. There's football at the end of this week and football every Saturday until the first of uh, the year on the college front. That's going to do it for this edition of the VolQuest.com podcast. For Rob Lewis, Austin Price, and Jesse Simpson, I'm Brent Hubbs. Have a great Monday, everybody.